Welcome to this graduation ceremony in which, above all, we celebrate the achievements of you, our graduates. Those are the words with which I begin my remarks when I speak in the Senate House of the University of London at a normal in-person graduation ceremony. But they apply even more to this virtual ceremony, which we're holding online for safety reasons. Because the normal Birkbeck graduate has to juggle their work responsibilities with their family responsibilities, with their studies. And they achieve their aims by tremendous dedication. But you have had done even more than that. You've had to do that but you've had to do it under very difficult circumstances, studying online from home, perhaps with difficulties about your internet connection, perhaps with disturbances from your family and children, or perhaps even having to fight your partner over the kitchen table as to who could use it for their work or their other activities. And so you have really achieved something. And that is why I've chosen to speak individually at each of the nine graduation ceremonies this week in order to emphasize that my commitment and my admiration for you, rather than simply pre-recording my remarks. This is the last of those nine ceremonies. And so I want to particularly thank everybody involved in making them work so efficiently, particularly Daniel from our external relations department, who's led on this, and Steve from our technical associates who have achieved everything working very smoothly. So thank you to you all. Thank you also to your partners, relatives, and friends for all that they have done to support you, perhaps by looking after the children, or perhaps by seeding the kitchen table to you so that you could do your online study. So we say thank you to you. But we also have a message for you, and that is that Birkbeck is for everyone. You too can come and study at Birkbeck. You can seize back the kitchen table for the online part of our activities, and you can now, of course, come into Birkbeck and study in person at various other things like lectures and seminars. So providing the best blended learning approach for time poor part time students. So do think about that. Equally graduates, think about whether a further qualification at Birkbeck would assist your career or assist your studies. So do think about that, because now is a very exciting time to be part of Birkbeck. In a couple of weeks time, we will reach our 198th anniversary, nearly there for the 200 years of Birkbeck. Very few institutions reach their 200th anniversary, but still fewer do it doing something which their founders would recognize. If George Birkbeck came on this virtual call now, he wouldn't understand about virtual calls. He might not understand about some of the subjects that you've studied, but he would understand about our educating working Londoners to do their very best and to gain further qualifications. Equally, of course, Birkbeck has an obligation to provide our students with the very best facilities. A couple of weeks ago, the mayor of Camden opened our new building on the Euston Road, which contains state-of-the-art teaching facilities, as well as social facilities for students, emphasizing particularly students interacting in small groups to aid their learning. We will do this on a much bigger scale in the building formerly known as Student Central, and now known as Birkbeck Central, adjacent to our main building, where we will develop further teaching rooms, further social space, and space for our students' union. This will allow us to achieve our long-held ambition of teaching all our students on Birkbeck premises. No longer will we rely on other institutions which may or may not provide appropriate facilities, where there may be difficulties with the IT because we don't control it, or even where students have been locked in lecture theatres by overzealous porters going home after six o'clock. Similarly, the government has now recognized for the first time the importance of lifelong learning. It intends to introduce a lifelong learning entitlement for all. We need to continue to lobby for that to be most favorable to our students and to mature learners. You, our graduates, have an opportunity to play your part in that by telling everyone what you have achieved and how you have achieved it, helped by both. Because today, of course, is ultimately about saluting your achievements. As the history of Birkbeck is written, people will look back on this graduating class of 2021 and say they did something special. They graduated under conditions of great difficulty, perhaps unprecedented since the Second World War, where Birkbeck was the only college of the University of London to continue operating in London throughout the Blitz. So you will be a special part of that, 
Birkbeck, you have achieved magnificently under these very difficult conditions. On behalf of myself and all the staff at Birkbeck, I salute your achievements. Congratulations to you all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christopher Alstrovich and I'm the head of philosophy here at Birkbeck. And I just wanted to say to all of our graduates to extend my congratulations on behalf of myself and the entire department. And to say that while, of course, we're very sad that we can't celebrate together, we're all very happy for you. And of course, graduating under normal circumstances is a significant achievement and even more so under these extraordinary circumstances that you've all been working. And I do hope that you and all of your loved ones are keeping safe and well, and I'm sure they're all just as proud of you as we are. Now, you've worked really hard, and I hope that you're now able to take some time to savor this significant achievement of yours. So many congratulations from all of us. We all wish you the very best, and please do keep in touch with us all here in the philosophy department. And we look forward to hearing everything about your next adventures. Hello, everyone. Um, we, the Department of Politics, have decided to put together a short congratulations message to all of you, our brilliant students, who somehow, despite the odds, have made it through to the point of graduation. And so this message is, is a message from us to say, enormous congratulations to you for persevering through a really difficult end of degree process. We all know what that entailed. And for coming out the other side with your degree certificates. Um, it is no small success in any normal year. It's an even greater success that we see you achieving this today. We're really sad that we can't be with you in Senate House, uh, with you floating around in your gowns and, and us raising a glass to you. But um, in lieu of that, here I'd like to present uh, my colleagues from the Department of Politics. Here we go. Yes, I'd like to also congratulate all of you for uh, your achievement. It is no mean feat to complete a degree at uh, the best of times, and notably in the circumstances many of the people do so at Birkbeg, part-time, mature learners and so forth, but obviously under the current circumstances it's um, an even greater uh, accomplishment. Thanks for bearing with us in this transition. Uh, we, we know that the end of last year has been, been tricky and, and uh, has involved also a, a lot of work on your side. So once again, congratulations and good luck with the future. Congratulations, everyone. What an amazing achievement. You've all finished your degrees and you've had an incredible journey with us. I've loved working with you. All of the staff have loved working with you. It's been a really profound journey, I hope, for you. And just congratulations on this graduation day. And really do stay in touch with us. I wish you all the luck for your futures. Um, and yeah, just to say, it's been amazing working with you and thank you for all the contributions that you've made to Psychosocial Studies Department and really hope to see you back with us again soon. Hi there, this is a message for the Counselling Pathway students. Firstly, I wanted to say how sad I am that because of COVID restrictions, we are not able to meet in person to celebrate your really very wonderful achievement. However, I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you, even if virtually, um, to mark this very special moment with you. Graduating with a degree is a fantastic achievement in any time frame, but I think never could the achievement be so great as this year after all the strains and all the challenges of the pandemic. I really wanted to say just how much I enjoyed our online seminars together. Every single one of you threw yourself into your studies and every single one of you made a massive contribution to the group. All of you generously giving your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions. You worked so hard and all of your outcomes, I think, reflect this. I'm really proud of what you achieved and I really sincerely hope that you also are hugely proud of yourselves. I hope that you've all had a good and a very well-deserved rest 
And I hope that perhaps I'll hear that some of you will be continuing, maybe in academic study, perhaps you might be thinking of an MA in psychosocial studies, or you might be thinking of the clinical training on the MSc. But whether you continue, choose to continue with your study or whether you decide to take a break and focus on other things, um, I know that all of you have got a really huge amount to give to the world. So I really look forward to hearing more about your next steps. Please do keep in touch. Please let me know how you're getting on. Um, and just once again, many congratulations and very, very well done to you all. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, this is a short message for all of our students in the BA Psychosocial Studies and the BA Psychosocial Studies with Principles of Psychodynamic Counselling. So here we are, not how we planned it, but you made it. I want to give a big congratulations to every single one of you for everything that you've achieved. It really seems like just yesterday we were sitting together in those seminars for love, for hate and for power way back at the start of your beginning um, of the psychosocial journey. And here you are today, graduating. Look, you know this, graduating from this program is a huge achievement in itself. But to graduate in the circumstances that you have, and after everything that you've been through, makes it even more special and even more impressive. Truly, it's been a privilege to teach you, but also to learn from you, over these last few years. I want to give a big shout out to Natalie Banton, who is the winner of the 2021 Psychosocial Studies Outstanding Dissertation Prize for her project, which was titled A Moment of Ease, Black Women's Resistance to the Attempted Erasure of Society's Gazes, Their Existence Within This Tough Matrix as Enabled Through Moments of Ease and Alternative Ways of Being. Well done, Natalie. And you are all outstanding. Each and every one of you really has brought so much to our program and so much to our department over the last few years. And we really will miss you greatly. Whatever you do next, we wish you all the best. And we really do hope that you will stay in touch with us. So again, congratulations to all of you. Savour this moment. You deserve it. Vice Chancellor, President and distinguished guests, I present the following graduates from the School of Social Sciences, History and Philosophy. The BA in Global Politics and International Relations, Viola Moss, Rida Khalil, Buruke Berhi, Samuel Kamara, Jose Romero, Aurora Picardo, Patricia Kroos, Munira Mal, Megan Wiborne, Amber Sedki Farag, Caleb Johnson, and Mohammed Chowdhury. The BA in Philosophy, Stephen Sherd, German Roberto Mora, Trong Tran, Albion Shamoli, Andreas Panagiotu, Errol Graham, Peter Vettese, Gerardo Posada Magana. The BA in Politics, Sumaya Zarelli, and Mark Graham. Now, would you please unmute your microphones and join with me and your supporters and friends and family congratulating all of you on your wonderful achievements. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done, boys. Well done. BA in Politics, Philosophy and History, Ellie Fleming, Erin Moran, Amal Abdullahi, Leah Moy, and John McDonough. The BA in Psychosocial Studies, Natalie Banton, Samantha O'Donoghue, Candace Brown, and Georgina Ashby. The BA in Psychosocial Studies and Principles of Psychodynamic Counseling, Leah Pritchard, Edith Kibiko, Hannah Bavis, Nikisha Morris, Lucinda Beckles, 
Anuzia Pitsinga, Lacrimoya Tripon, the BSc in Social Sciences, Anna Hall, Shuvashish Tapa, Fauzia Ahmed Idris. Please can I ask you now to unmute your microphones and join with me, your family, friends and supporters in congratulating each other on your wonderful achievements. So congratulations, all of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The Certificates of Higher Education in Higher Education Introductory Studies. Ikra Muhayadin, Adil Osman, Meshel Sandanam, Cassandra Boshoff, Shannon Ambersley Bissell, J. Rail Paris, and Thirza Biendara. The Certificate in Higher, Higher Education in Psychodynamic Counseling. Gaylene John, Celeste Mbweze, Caroline Birdsell, Erica Daniel, Dawn Anderson, Candice Morris, Scott Bradley, Vanessa Short, Elizabeth Hollington, Abigail Hardy, Lydia Fothergill, and Sonia Russell. Can I ask all of you now to unmute your microphones and join with me, your family, friends, and supporters in congratulations on your wonderful achievements. Congratulations to all of you. The Graduate Certificate in Psychodynamic Practice, Elodie Lucina Beckles, Afi Walsh, Iliana Glusica, Cheryl Giradel, Kerry Edwards, Kitty Dobe, Nicole Montague, Omar Safdari, Ruby Johnson, Samantha Forres, Shannon Best, Gemma Ritchie, Angela McCulloch, and Jonna Hearn. The MA in Psychosocial Studies, Ariane Plumley. The MSc in Government, Policy and Politics, Lisa Whiting, David McGregor, Philip Lewis, and Amber McClatchy. The MSc in Global Environmental Politics and Policy, Alexandra Padgic. The MSc in International Security and Global Governance, Mariglen Machka and Michael Johnson. The MSc in Psychodynamic Counseling and Psychotherapy, Sherston Miller and Sam White. Can I ask all of you now to please unmute your microphones, join with me, your family, supporters and friends in congratulating you on your wonderful achievements. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the MSc in Public Policy and Management, Kathleen Caper, Belle Crew, Abdul Shah, and Claire Alsop. The MSc in Social Research, Hugh Jones. The PhD in Politics, with a thesis entitled Rethinking Biopolitical Bordering in Europe, Survival, Migration and the Politics of Perseverance, Antonella Pateri. The PhD in Psychosocial Studies, with a thesis entitled Building Bridges, Negotiating Boundaries, Young Christians, Jews and Muslims Experience of Interfaith Work in the UK, Lenita Torning. Can I ask all of you now to please unmute your microphones and join with me and everyone in congratulating you on your wonderful achievements. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, everyone. This concludes the presentation of graduates from the School of Social Sciences, History and Philosophy. I want to congratulate all of you on your successes, especially during such a difficult and challenging time for all of us. On behalf of all of my colleagues in the school, I want to wish you the very best for the future. I now, now hand over to, your, to my colleagues.
Today, it is a great honour to welcome Judith Butler to a college fellowship here at Birkbeck University of London. Judith Pamela Butler is one of the most widely read philosophers on the planet and the most influential voice in contemporary gender theory. Butler's name is inseparable from queer theory, feminism, radical ethics, critical theory. Their books, she identifies as non-binary, their books are foundational texts in gender and philosophy courses in universities throughout the world, but also central texts in literary, film and performance studies. Butler's reach, however, extends far outside the academy. Their name and ideas are widely referenced in popular culture as well. Even scriptwriters working in mainstream television, film, comic books feel comfortable sprinkling in references to heteronormativity and performativity, thanks to Butler. As a black character in the TV series Scandal casually mentioned, oh, race is just a social construct. So where did this intellectual icon come from? Butler was born 1956 to a dentist father and a mother who advocated for fair housing. Butler's parents, who were of Hungarian Jewish and Russian Jewish descent, were practicing reformed Jews. Butler grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. One anecdote about their early life starts with the comment that they were a too talkative adolescent. When asked about their dream job, they responded, Hmm, well, either a philosopher or a clown. Now, admittedly, as an adult, they are fun and funny, but philosophy was the correct decision. They attended Bennington College, a private liberal arts college in Vermont, before moving to Yale University for their BA, MA and PhD in philosophy. Their PhD, awarded in 1984, explored the concept of desire from a Hegelian perspective. Since 1993, they have been based at the University of California, Berkeley, becoming the Maxine Elliott Professor of Rhetoric and Comparative Literature in 1998. They are legally non-binary and live in Berkeley with their partner, the distinguished political theorist Wendy Brown and musician's son Isaac. Now, it's impossible to even hint at the full range of Butler's intellectual work. They have made important interventions into our understanding of hate speech and censorship, the politics of Palestine, Jewish identity and ethics, intersex persons, the unknowability of oneself and others, the politics of mourning, or why some lives are less valued than others radical equality, the force of non-violence, and the significance of public protests and assembly. Relational interdependency is important to their way of thinking. Spurning an individualist perspective, Butler insists that each of our lives are bound up with the lives of others. You can't exaggerate the impact that Butler's books have had on the world. The book Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, published in 1990 when they were only 33 years old, has been translated into 27 languages and sold over 100,000 copies. That book and its sequel, Bodies That Matter, on the discursive limits of sex, published three years later, were influenced by continental philosophers such as Hegel, Freud, Levi Strauss, Foucault, Lacan, Eric Garay, Derrida, Christeva, de Beauvoir, as well as the philosopher of language J. L. Austin. Now, Butler argues that gender is constituted by a repetition of actions and speech acts that give the illusion of an underlying essence that does not, in fact, exist. Now, when Butler writes about performativity, they are not referring to anything like theatrical or phenomenological, since such approaches take the gendered self to be prior to its acts. Rather, they understand constituting acts not only as constituting the identity of the actor, 
but as constituting that identity as a compelling illusion, as an object of belief. In their words, gender is always a doing, although not a doing by a subject who might be said to pre-exist the deed. The doer is variably constructed in and through the deed. For Butler, the name women achieves stability and coherence only in the context of the heterosexual matrix. This, they write, is part of the pleasures of drag, which in the place of the law of heterosexual coherence, we see sex and gender denaturalized by means of a performance which avows their distinctness and dramatizes the cultural mechanism of their fabricated unity. Although three decades old, these texts remain relevant to current debates about trans, for example. When in 1990, Butler contended that Contemporary feminist debates over the meaning of gender lead time and again to a certain sense of trouble, as if the indeterminacy of gender might eventually culminate in the failure of feminism. This trouble in feminism today is represented by the small but vocal trans-exclusionary radical feminism, which attacks the dignity of trans people. Butler's response to them is to insist that a feminism of inclusion that respects the complexity of gendered lives is the only feminism worth defending. To say that Butler is an international celebrity academic fails to grasp the full range of activism that they have always been engaged with. They believe in the power of public gatherings and reflect eloquently on movements such as Black Lives Matter. They have been involved with the Occupy Wall Street movement, Jewish Voice for Peace, the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. They adhere to an ethco-political position of nonviolence, not as a passive practice that emulates from a calm region of the soul, nor as a individualist ethical relation to existing perhaps forms of power, but rather as an ethical position found in the midst of the political field. Awards, prizes, distinctions have been showered upon Butler. They have been awarded the Andrew Mellon Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in the Humanities and the Adorno Prize from the city of Frankfurt for their contributions to feminist and moral philosophy. Yale University awarded Butler the Brudner Prize for long lifetime achievement in gay and lesbian studies, while the city of Cologne awarded them the Albertus Magnus Professorship, awarded to a person of international renown who addresses issues that are important, not only in the fundamental sciences, but also in public debate. They have received at least 12 honorary degrees. In 2014, they were awarded the Diploma of the Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters from the French Cultural Ministry. They are a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and members of both the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Butler has been a generous contributor to our Birkbeck community. They have been a visiting fellow in the Department of Psychosocial Studies at Birkbeck since 2009, and active not only in that department, but also in the Department of Law and the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities. Now remember, Butler is one of the busiest thinkers in the world yet has found time to engage in numerous public conversations with Birkbeck staff and students, contribute to our books, give lectures and seminars to the wider public as well as to graduate students. We have all been inspired, enraged and enthralled by their thinking and humbled by their warmth and generosity of spirit. Most of all,
Butler has inspired us by insisting that in order to achieve ideals of radical justice, equality and freedom for everyone, but especially minoritized and marginalized people of this world, key concepts must be solidarity and the building of coalitions. Radical equality will require collective action. Butler invites us to ask, what kind of world do we want to build together? Then imagine the radical possibilities. Forge alliances with others to make them happen. By accepting this college fellowship, Judith Butler signals their support of our educational, ethical and political mission to make a positive difference to the lives of others. We are thrilled that Butler has agreed to become a fellow of Buckbeck. It is uh, with great pleasure and humility that I receive this honor from you all today. I am most thankful to Joanna Burke, um, to the Vice Chancellor, the Dean, to all who have made this possible, but especially the faculty of the Psychosocial Program and the Law School here at Birkbeck College, where I've been lucky enough to find some of the very best interlocutors on so many topics that concern our complex lives as social and psychological. I realize that I have been visiting the Department of Psychosocial Studies since it began, and that I've seen it grow into one of the most dynamic and creative faculties in the field. Indeed, the field of psychosocial studies has been renewed and redefined by this very department as a critical and imaginative interdisciplinary exploration. It serves now as the model, if not the paradigm, of psychosocial work everywhere. Although many justifications and explanations have been given for psychosocial studies, many of us know the value of such work intimately, even if we do not always call it by that name. Consider, for instance, the sense of isolation or depression that you have lived with during these many months. Um, they, we've, we've all felt, we've all felt that under pandemic conditions. Consider as well how many people have overwhelmed the psychotherapeutic community these days with their calls for help. No psychotherapist I know has time enough to take on new clients at this point. But even the conditions that affect us equally produce very different kinds of reactions. Even the conditions that seem to affect us equally affect minority communities more than others. Those who call psychotherapists are looking for support for their individual situations, to be sure, and yet it very often turns out that those very intimate feelings of fear, isolation, and longing are situated in a social reality that is shared by a wider community, sometimes a global community. This is a contemporary social reality with a history. If you think about it, nothing could be more personal and singular than the fear for one's own bodily safety. And yet it matters when one realizes how many women and LGBTQI people undergo that fear on the street, in the workplace, or in their homes. It matters how many black and brown people undergo that fear in proximity to the police or the store owner who regards them with suspicion. It is very much their own fear, but it is also, at the same time, someone else's fear as well. Others have felt something like this, or they are, in fact, experiencing it right now somewhere else. Such moments of convergence between our personal feelings and our social worlds show that in spheres of life we might think of as most personal, the social has a way of emerging. The social has been, in fact, in operation all along. The way we fear, 
or desire or love is in some way shaped by our social worlds, and yet we live that fear differently depending on the fantasies that it invokes on us, the ideation that gives it meaning, the memories with which it is associated. And we find ways of living with or working with those fears and desires that are in no sense determined in advance by society or societal norms. With the idea of the psychosocial, we find ourselves always at a crossroads. Some would say, but we have to choose. Are we sociologists or are we psychologists? Uh, some would say approach the phenomenon through sociology or approach the phenomenon through psychology or psychoanalysis in particular. But what if to explain certain social realities we need both fields to determine the phenomenon at hand that we cannot even describe it without both fields working together? And what if we need a place where both fields meet and become fundamentally transformed through that very encounter. The two fields do not encounter each other across a table at a distance. They are always in relation to some object, some condition, some phenomenon that cannot rightly be understood without an interdisciplinary collaboration. For instance, sometimes in psychology, one starts with an understanding of the individual or the self, who is then described as entering the social world, as if the social world is outside, separated spatially from the individual. Or maybe one starts with the idea of the group and then asks, well, what specifies the group as something other than a collection of bounded individuals? But if we can say that each of us emerges, as the people we are, through being partially formed by social norms, practices, institutions, economic conditions, and the sense of limit and possibility they impose on mobility and expression, and it follows that the social is working on us before any of us individuate, or rather it is there as the very means and material of individuation. We think of individuals perhaps as bounded subjects, but under pandemic conditions, we are mindful of the ways that our bodies open onto a shared world, how all the orifices establish our sociality, our relation to natural elements, our dependency on a well-organized world. We breathe each other's air. We find ourselves in proximity to strangers whose health status we do not know. We take protections not only to secure ourselves against the virus, but to protect some set of yous, you out there, the you I know, as well as the you I do not know and may never know. Sometimes we take precautions because what I call my self-protection is inevitably bound up with my protection of you. The same situation of proximity in space, the same need for air, means that one life is bound up with another, that a social bond exists among us, whether or not it is codified or contractual, whether or not we even know it. One reason our bodies are not quite the same as property is that the requirement to live as a body depends fundamentally on the air that we breathe. Is it clean? Does it carry a virus? Uh, it depends as well on a shelter in which we can live with some enduring sense that we are protected from the elements and from violence. Depends on nourishment, which we know remains inadequate, unaffordable, or inaccessible to so many. We are not bounded. We are, in every case, dependent on there being an environment, a natural world, a set of others, a set of social organizations that help to keep us living on. The way we can start a story with this singular self, bounded and discreet, is of course important. We all tell personal stories, we write autobiographies, we engage in memoir. Or we can start with a theory, an hypothesis, or a methodology that begins with a singular and bounded subject. Surely that's possible too. 
But at some point, we have to give an account of how that singularity got formed, how that I, that first person, came into being and was sustained or imperiled, and through what means, in what world. And what, in that singularity, that singular selfhood, is shared with others and cannot be understood outside of that context. So that doesn't tell us what social world made possible the emergence of that singularity when we start with the individual subject. It's true that the boundaries of the body contain us in some ways, they make us discreet, but they are also porous, opening us toward the world in ways we require in order to live, in order to love. Those life requirements entail infrastructures of care, and when those infrastructures fail, our lives are, in fact, imperiled. My sense is that psychosocial studies does not deny the importance of this body and this life in its singularity, the one that belongs to you, but not exactly as property. It insists that methodological individualism cannot be the, po the point of departure, for that begs the question of the social and psychic formation of subjects. Psychosocial studies does not deny the importance of the group, hardly, but the group cannot stand for all the social structures and conditions that form and limit our lives, nor can it explain the aggression by which one group differentiates, differentiates itself from another, or the fantasy of the nation that sometimes binds them. It could have been climate change or the radical inequality of food distribution that showed how our singular lives, uh, our singular embodied lives, requiring air, shelter, food, and water, link us in the immediate here and now to the elements of the world, to social and economic worlds, and make social creatures of us all. At the same time, our relationship to nourishment, to trust, dependency, and desire reveal the psychic dimensions of our lives bound up with our basic orientation toward nourishment, care, aggression, an orientation that is a blend of perception and fantasy. We sometimes speak of economic and social powers as if they are distinct from psychic life, but those very powers help to form psychic powers. When we consider xenophobia or racism, when we consider the operative fantasies about women that provide the rationale for sexual subordination and violence, we are talking about phenomena that are social and psychological. So we need a socially informed psychoanalysis to read and understand the dominant fantasies of our time. We need this like we need air to breathe in order to live on, to live on together, to find the social forms that secure the conditions for life for everyone and establish care, not only within the province of the family, but for communities across the globe. Without the psychosocial, we cannot come to know ourselves in relations with one another, our independency, our conflicts, and our shared needs. For some phenomena, like the denial of climate change, uh, are psychosocial in nature. And without a full interdisciplinary understanding of that phenomenon, we will risk the future of the Earth. So I thank you for this honor, and I congratulate you on finishing your work. It is a moving experience to be here and see this moment of completion. It's so hard to work under pandemic conditions, and yet you obviously kept your communities together. And I thank you now for making me part of your community, a community in which I have found the most vibrant and compelling teaching and research, where I have seen the extraordinary attention that all these faculty give to their students. I'm pleased and I'm honored to be part of this community of scholars who have invited me into this project of seeking to understand and change our world in times that have brought a new sense of peril, as well as new hopes for broad and broadening solidarities. Those solidarities require scholars and students who have learned how to think critically and with imagination, who can allow us to see and hold the complexity of this world in order pre precisely to become knowing about where and how 
we can make a difference. I thank you. Greetings, everyone. Greetings to the master, to my academic colleagues, but primarily greetings to you, the graduates today, and your family and friends who are there with you to celebrate your graduating. Congratulations to every one of you. So what is becoming clear throughout COVID, and this is the second year in which I've recorded this message. Last year, it was rather more formal. I still pretended that I was at a lectern uh, addressing a huge room full of people, but I'm not now. I was speaking from my home on my laptop to each one of you. So it's to you that I'm speaking. And what we've learned over this time is that we are living through really strange and bewildering times. We simply can't predict what's going to become of the world. What's going to become of work and how we work? What about housing? Will we work from home when we learn in different, live in different places? Will we move to the country? Will tower blocks cease to be what we want in life as places to either work or live? What will happen to all the different issues politically on the, around the world? And what about the planet? Will that survive? There can't have been an issue as great as that for, well, since the start of time. So here we are facing all these problems and thinking it's never been as bad as it is now. Well, let me tell you, at other epochs, it's always seemed cataclysmic in some ways. When George Birkbeck called that meeting in 1823, asking working people if they'd like an education, would they please turn up at the Crown and Anchor pub in Fleet Street? 2,000 people arrived. He must have thought the world had changed. What happened? Did he mean it? Did he expect it to be that kind of response? And of course it was. It was changing the world of education forever. He can hardly have known. And also he can hardly have known what would develop because he was living through a time of great change too. I made a note of some of them. I've got them here. The things that changed England at that time, the UK in general, but primarily the invention, let's say, of the railways. That must have seemed like the end of the world. The railways were going to take over, the America would be conquered, the West, India would be revolutionized. The invention of railways in the 1820s must have felt like heralding the end of the world as they knew it, as indeed it did. Then there was the horse-drawn omnibus in London, public transport, nobody had ever thought of that before, except in coaches uh, from along the highway. The uh, combustion engine was patented, presaging the most revolutionary change in transport you can imagine. All sorts of strange institutions were founded, the Metropolitan Police happened, the Oxford Union, where so many of our politicians, so many of our prime ministers have been the leading president including the present Prime Minister. Um, the Metropolitan Police, very important. The RSPCA, people started to care about animals, the welfare of animals. So these were all interesting ways of responding to change. And then, of course, the arts was flourishing at that time. We had the great sweep of great poets. Keats, not to live young, long, but to write wonderful poetry that still echoes today in the hearts of today's poets. Shelley, calling for political action to be echoed by Mick Jagger years later. Um, Byron, of course, going out to Greece where he would die, defending, uh, fighting for Greek independence, a legend, leaving behind scandal, great poetry and political engagement. So this was an extraordinary time of change. And people would think, how are we to deal with it? It's challenging and it's a bit bewildering. Well, Today is both challenging and bewildering. I would say you could sum it up in two words, really, briskly, from the newspaper headlines, COVID and Brexit. How are we to see both of those issues unravel and be, um, be some good? How are we to thrive? How are we to solve the problems that it presents? Is the world getting better or is it getting worse? We just don't know how it's going to work out. And the, here's my message for you, because with every crisis, there is opportunity. George Birkbeck knew that. And I'm telling you, it's your opportunity. Because nothing equips people to deal with crises so much as a trained mind 
knowing how to assess uh, evidence, how to weigh up the pros and cons of argument, how to set out an argument without coming to blows, I hope, and how to deal with the, both the challenge and the bewilderment. Your degree at Birkbeck has put you in that position and I urge you to use it to the utmost degree. You will relish doing so. Problem solving is one of the great delights in life and you have problems ahead of you and the skills to resolve them. So to each and every one of you, my congratulations and good luck for the future. Welcome to the Birkbeck Alumni Community. You might be in the UK or much further afield. It might be morning, afternoon or evening. Wherever you are right now, we as fellow members of the Birkbeck Alumni Community want to send our congratulations to you for what you've achieved. Completing a course at Birkbeck in normal circumstances is by no means an easy endeavour. So what you have accomplished is really something truly special. Today you are graduating and you should take a moment to reflect what a huge accomplishment this is. Completing your studies does not mean the end of your Birkbeck journey. You are joining a community of over 60,000 alumni in over 140 different countries. So no matter where you are in the world, you won't be far from a fellow Birkbeck graduate. There are lots of exciting events, activities and opportunities for you to stay connected with Birkbeck. Visit bbk.ac.uk forward slash alumni to find out more and update your contact details. We are proud to share this day with you. Have a wonderful time celebrating. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations.